It has been redraft week for you on The Athletic this week, Corey. You've gone and done the past four drafts, 2022, 2021, 2020, 2019, if my counting is correct. Uh, and and we're going to go through them today a little bit. Uh, some fun trends I think we can hit on. Obviously, the, the meat of this is we're talking about a prospect ranking, right? It's not so much this team should have done this. It's, it's revisiting what the class looks like uh, one, two, three, four years later. So uh, we can dive right in there. I think it makes the most sense to start with this most recent one. And I was a little surprised that you still have Yuri Slavkovsky as the top player in this class. Well, I think it's it was close a year ago this time, and I think it's still close. Like I'm not sure there's been a player that has so clearly risen above him. And if you've wanted to argue David Yerchek, if you wanted to argue Logan Cooley or Kevin Korczynski or whoever your favorite prospect is over Yuri Slavkovsky, I think it's reasonable. But I, I, we had this argument in the summer when we had uh, the, the debate episode with Chris Peters and Scott Wheeler about Logan Cooley. Logan Cooley had a fantastic season in college. It was in college. It was not in the NHL. Yuri Slavkovsky was in the NHL. And I think if you would evaluate the two a year ago before then, I, I lean Slavkovsky. So it's, I think this season will be a very interesting debate because Yerchek right now is in the NHL. I thought he looked good in, uh, in his first game uh, up since Zakowinski's injury. And so we'll see how he does uh, while he has his opportunity to play. And we'll see how Cooley does. Very promising start early on to his NHL career. Uh, but I, I don't see, like, like, I don't know what Slavkovsky did to, you know, to not be in the conversation at least. He's still in, I, I think that, I think that's a fair way to put it. You do have it as a tier, I guess, in fairness. You have a tier of Slavkovsky, Juracek, and Cooley at the top. Cooley as, as number three. I guess I would have thought that he's the guy who's maybe raised his profile, maybe less about Slavkovsky and certainly not Juracek. Slavkovsky, Juracek obviously is rising here. But I, to me, at least watching, I feel like my, my question with Cooley had more to do with what is he going to look like as he translates up levels against bigger, faster players. And it's been really good. And given right. that, I think that the, dyna- the dynamism, right, in, in two games, but even in college last year too, I think you could say, like the dynamism you're seeing at, at the center position, I guess for me, would make Cooley number one. And he might be number one by this time next year. Like if 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 he continues to look this good over the course of the full season, that might be where I land ultimately when we do this exercise again in in a year's time. But for right now, I I still think it's really close. You could pick. I think it's a pick him. You know, Slavkovsky's tool physical toolkit is way above, but obviously. Cooley's skating and and skill are really dynamic. Uh, Yurichek also has a very appealing and, and at times dynamic toolkit. So I, I think all those guys have very reasonable arguments. But again, you know, if you have to kind of do the what if, like what if Slavkovsky yeah. had played college hockey last season? You know, it's I I still think it would I think it would have been really close. I think he could have had the kind of season that Logan Cooley had. Yeah, to your point, this being the most recent draft, there's probably going to be the least kind of movement here. We're still seeing a lot of that within the top 10, right? Pavel Minchikov jumps up a couple spots to number eight. Simon Nemec drops a few spots to number seven. But the two guys who I think really maybe kind of stand out moves here uh, at 10 and 11, Philip Bestead and Owen Pickering. I'm curious, especially with Bestead, who was a later first round pick, uh, what's kind of driving him up? And obviously the, the, the play in the SHL was really strong last season. Yeah, 6'3 center, skates well, good offensive skills, goal, you know, you know, can score goals, can make plays. I didn't love his compete in his draft year, and, and that's looked a lot better for me as as a as a pro uh, in the SHL. He gets to the inside, he wins battles. Uh, I think he's going to be a you know a big time player for their national teams going forward at both the U twenty and the senior level. Uh, might even play senior level this season. He got an invite to the senior team at the end of last season. Uh, just you know has a lot of the traits that you look for uh in a true top center prospect i mean i'm not saying i'm not sure the offense is going to be like elite to be a true top of the lineup center uh but i see him fitting in really well behind will smith on a potential shark step chart yeah and i think it is something that they're you know that draft is going to be obviously a hugely consequential one with for san jose with they make the big big trade back there and if they can get the value that, that it seems like they're going to get out of beast at uh, that goes a long way to making that a successful draft for them. Uh, a couple of guys that they kind of fell that I wanted to ask you about. Denton Matejchuk, who I've liked every time I've sure. seen him, really. He he drops pretty substantially in this one for you. Right. And he had a really strong training camp. And, and there was a lot of positive things said about him through his camp process. I tried not to 
tweak this too much based on training camps. Yeah. Uh, I've been fooled many a times over the years by training camps. And I like to let the full season play really dictate where guys fall uh, on these type of preseason or really early in the season exercises. And Matej Chuck, I thought in his last full WHL season was good, but I didn't think he was exceptional. I didn't think he was a dominant WHL defenseman. I still think his skating and his skill are standout traits, and he could be that this upcoming year. I think they are hoping he will be that, especially after a strong training camp, that he'll go down in the dump. He'll be a top player. He'll be a top player for Canada's under-20 team. And I think that's realistic, uh, but he has to get it done still. And I thought watching him last year in the Western League, he looked like a, just a pretty nice 5'11 defenseman and not a, what I thought he could be in a draft year, which was a potentially uh, unique 5'11 defenseman. I think he's got to prove that a little bit more over the course of a full year. Yeah, I, I do like what you say about you know not overreacting too much to, to the early camp, and, and I imagine that's why Matthew Poitras is in the 40s here, right? Because based sure. on what we see, he's quick to the NHL. He's made a little bit of an impact, but it's still so early. Yeah. Oh yeah, because I, I think I talked about this on the episode last week. Like I've seen Victor Mete do this. Like I, I've seen these guys who you think aren't going to make it, and then they make it. And then two years later, they're they're a healthy scratch, or yeah. they're, in the, they're they're in the American League. And and like I said, everything about Poitras' start has been not just promising, extremely promising. If you're a Bruins fan, you're ecstatic with this camp. You're ecstatic with how his first game or so has went. But he's still a 5'11", mediocre skating forward who's going to have to really prove it game after game, I think, for me to elevate him to being a true top-tier prospect. Even if it seems like that's where the trajectory is extremely early into his pro career. Yeah. Yeah. And I wonder, I don't know if, you, if you've gotten much feedback uh, in NHL circles or, or not from these lists yet. It's, it's obviously they're just coming out this week. Any quibbles with Matthew Savoy at 19? Yeah, no, I don't think so. I think that's kind of the consensus among NHL people. He didn't have a, you know the year you hoped he would last season. And obviously he got injured in training camp, so he didn't get to prove in, in Sabres camp that, that he's taken a step. Still a very nice player, but kind of the same analysis as Matejchuk where great skater, great skill, competes well, but for a tiny guy, it's not special traits you usually associate with a top 10 pick of that frame. And that's something he will need to prove going forward as he does have those special elements in his game that he can show consistently. And then one more guy here that I I, I really think the, the fan base is going to be keyed in on. I guess I haven't scrolled the comments too in depth here, but Lane Hudson's a guy who ever since his draft, uh, the arrow's been... Up, right? I mean, and I don't think you're surprised with this based on what he did at the at the national program. We knew he could, uh, you know, be a dynamic player, but he does it in college. Uh, he, he looked outstanding at the at the World Junior Camps, and I, I think going into this, a lot of fans are hopeful that he now projects as a top four D. Uh, you've got him here in the mid twenties. I think it's at twenty five on this list. What went into the calculus on how to place Lane Hudson? Because I do think that the upside is is really evident there. Right. And to your point, we thought he would be a very good college player right away, watching him with the national program. But I don't think even some of his biggest fans thought he was going to be this good real quickly. Where you're talking about a guy who was frankly a Hobie Baker discussion as a freshman, not the favorite, but a guy who was inserted into the conversation. That was unexpected and, and how good he was. And then he goes, not only has a good world junior camp, a few, a few months ago, but he has a strong men's world championship as a, as a under twenty player. So, uh, you know, ex- outstanding hockey sense and skill. A uh, very shifty, elusive player. Uh, you know, Hudson, as he was in his draft year, and as his brother Cole will be in this upcoming draft, is a very tough player to debate and remains so in NHL circles. And talking to some NHL scouts a year after that great performance at Boston University, there are some who feel he should have been a first-round pick, maybe even a strong first-round pick. But there are plenty of NHL people I talk to who still have their doubts, who still wonder how a tiny defenseman who is not an elite skater and doesn't have a ton of physicality in his game is going to translate into the NHL. And some might even say he will play in the NHL, but is he the kind of guy who can elevate in the postseason, is he the kind of guy who could be a premium player or is he going to be the kind of player who you're going to need to shelter? I think those questions are remain in some 
capacity. I kind of in the middle. I think there is some translatability question still that keep me from saying he is among you know the premier defense prospects outside the NHL. But I think there is definitely something different about this player. This is not just your standard small, pretty skilled defenseman. Like he's got some pretty elite traits in his game that makes me think it will translate that he will be a good NHL player. But I probably need to see more still at the highest levels, be it college, senior level, maybe even the world juniors, uh, to be confident that he should be, you know, called a top 10, top 15 pick caliber prospect.